Hi everyone, my name is Trishna and I work at the National Institute of Agriculture Botany in the UK. So this lecture will be about plant viruses. Um, I will start by a short introduction and then how you can detect a virus in a plant and how they are transmitted and ways that we can do to utilize the knowledge to reduce transmission in the field. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop me an email or I think there will be a live Q&A session um, at some point online. So I'll see you there then. So tobacco mosaic virus was the very first virus that is discovered. So around the late 1800, um, Meyer demonstrated that tobacco mosaic disease that they see on tobacco plants is caused by an infectious agent. And then later on, um, Bayer realized that the agent was unlike any previously identified pathogen and coined the term virus. So it is um, good to remember that plant viruses are often being given names based on the first plant that it was identified in. However, more than often, a plant virus can infect multiple host plants and not just one. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites and they came in the form of genomic nucleic acid so they can be DNA or RNA molecules. Usually um, they would be encased in a protective coat of a um, virus coat protein and a virus can only replicate when they're in a suitable host cell. So once they're in the infected cells, in a way for them to replicate, they need to utilize the host cell machinery and to do this, they will then need to um, assemble the required tools from the host cells. And they will reprogram normal activities of the host cell, and this is what often transcribed to as symptoms that we can see by eye on the plants. So viruses are usually transmitted between hosts as virions or virus particle, and they often have geometrically very fixed definable forms, such as helical or spears. So how do a virus enter the host plant? Virus cannot facilitate their own entry, so they need to be um, facilitated, facilitated by insects or through wounds or mechanical inoculation. So this is a short diagram showing how one can inoculate an infectious material onto a healthy plant. So one can simply put an abrasive compound such as sand or a bit of grit onto the surface of the leaf, and then you would then crush an infected leaf, you can use a mortar and pestle, and then you use this um, infected sap, infected leaf sap, and you just simply rub inoculated it onto the leaf, spray a bit of water, and then uh, you then leave the plant for about, say, three to seven days, and you would then see symptoms if a virus is present in your infected material. So another way um, for the virus to enter plant is by insects. And there are many insect species that can transmit viruses. Aphid is one of the most prominent factors for plant viruses. Aphid can be found um, worldwide. They have really wide host range. And they also um, persist all year round in both temperate, um, tropical climate. Uh, they are good. They can survive in low temperature, high temperature, so very, very abundant. An aphid has um, a specialized mouth part to feed, which is like a long thin needle. And this is what then makes them an ideal insect actually to transmit viruses because their feeding activity does not cause a lot of damage to the leaf, which means then it doesn't trigger the plant to mount an extensive defense responses to aphid feeding um, and hands. And also when they feed, they often go deep straight into the vascular bundle, um, the salamin phloem, which will be then um, good to facilitate virus transmission because obviously those um, vascular bundle runs through the entire plant, transmit the virus. Um, and yeah, other sap feeding insects do factor plant viruses such as mites, thrips or white flies. So once in the plant, how do the viruses move? So majority of viruses would use the same plastic pathway. So there's a cytoplasm, plasmodismata, and phloem. 
the upside of this is that you can actually use plant virus to study sympathetic network in the plant. So for example, one can make viruses that is tagged by the green fluorescent protein, um, as you can see in the picture here, and then they will then, um, you can use them to study how the virus move in the plant itself. And how do the virus move from cell to cell? So they move from cell to cell in the plant via plasmodesmata. So plasmodesmata are often fixed in size and they will only allow molecules of a certain size to pass through. So virus is smart. They can encode what we call as movement proteins. So tobacco mosaic virus movement protein is one of the first one discovered. It gated plasmodesmata. So imagine it's Imagine the movement protein like holding the plasmodium matter open and this allowed the virus to pass through. Other, virus, other viruses also encode different type of movement protein that for example form tubules and destroy plasmodium matter allowing virus to pass through. So viruses often have very very small genome. So the genome of their hosts are usually even a million times larger than the genome of viruses. So for example here, satellite tobacco necrosis virus is one of the smallest ones with only 17 nanometers of um, genome size. So in order to cope with the size of their small genome, viruses often encode multifunctional proteins. For example, is the cucumber mosaic virus, which they only encode for five proteins. And out of these five proteins, the three of them have multifunctional um, uses. So cucumber mosaic virus is one of the plant virus with the broadest host range. You can find them worldwide and as you can guess they were first identified in cucumber but they can also infect other um, economically important crop plants such as tomatoes, squash, zucchini, um, tobacco. So now to shift our attention back to um, the viral genome. So viral genomes can be a DNA or RNA. Uh, the majority of plant viruses are positive sense single-stranded RNA, as you can see um, the one that's circled in red. But you can also find plant viruses with um, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded negative RNA, and so on. So. So I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom tabs on this slide because majority of plant virus are either um, positive strand or negative strand single strand RNA. And it's important to remember that in order for these RNA viruses to be able to encode the proteins that they need in order to replicate and to spread within the host plant, they need to be first transcribed into complementary RNA, which would then need to be transcribed again into um, the genomic DNA. And this would require um, an enzyme, and these are first encoded, called RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So it's important to know whether your virus of interest is RNA or DNA virus, so then you can design the best method you need to study the virus. So if for a DNA virus, for example, you don't need to do DNA extraction or RNA virus, you need to do an RNA extraction. So how can one tell if a plant is infected by virus? So often it's really, really hard, especially out in the field, to differentiate whether um, a symptoms you see on the plant, is it caused by abiotic stress, um, for example, drought, or is it by other plant pathogens, such as bacteria and fungi, or is it caused by a plant virus? So one of the most common basic question that we need to address first is, whether the symptoms is transmissible to other healthy plants. So this can be done simply by if you see an infected plant in the field, for example, you can um, cut an infected leaf off and then crush the leaf and then sap inoculate it to a healthy plant of the same species and then see if the same symptoms develop or not. So here is a few pointers that is important and still very useful when one is trying to find out what causes a symptom. So Koch is a German scientist and he proposed uh, four postulates for pathogen. So the first one is the agent must be present in every case of the disease. The second, the agent must be isolated from 
host and growing pure culture, but this doesn't really apply to plant viruses. The third one is that the disease must be reproduced when a pure culture of the agent is inoculated into a healthy susceptible host. So this is when you take out the infected leaf sample and then sub-inoculate it to a healthy plant, whether you see the same symptoms again or not. And the last one is the same agent must be recovered again from the experimentally infected host. So if the plant that you inoculate become infected and you repeat the process again, can you then get the same symptoms again? So keeping this um, few uh, principles in mind would help you in order to identify what may cause um, your, the symptoms in your plant. So how can one use molecular biology um, to confirm and to identify virus infection in plants? Again, first you need to know whether your virus is RNA or DNA virus because this would then be important for you to decide how first you can collect your sample and second, once you have your sample, are you going to do RNA extraction or DNA extraction? In terms of sample collection, DNA extraction tends to be more um, forgiving. So often you can keep your leaf samples, for example, in minus 20 in ethanol, and they would be good enough for DNA extraction. But if you need to extract RNA from a leaf sample, you need to preserve the sample a lot more. Um, the usual method would be to flash freeze some in liquid nitrogen or certain buffer that would make sure that the RNA is preserved and isn't degraded because RNA is more easily degraded and if you didn't harvest your sample in the right way then your extraction wouldn't work because you wouldn't be able to get good quality RNA or DNA from your sample. After you collected your samples you then need to decide what kind of extraction you want to do. Is it RNA or is it DNA? Or perhaps if you want to do protein extraction in order to identify um, your virus protein of interest, then you need to do a protein extraction. Once that step is done, when you've extract, extracted RNA, DNA, or protein, you then need to decide what to do with it. Um, for RNA virus, you would then do RT-PCR. Um, DNA virus, you do a PCR, which um, PCR stands for, for polymerase chain reaction, and this is a molecular biology method that you use to amplify a tiny amount of your gene of interest um, and then if you add a suitable primer it will then multiply and then you can then look at your PCR product by running it on agarose gel. This would then be all explained in your practical materials or feel free to ask me a question if you want to know more about this. Uh, one thing I want to highlight in terms of using a molecular biology method to study virus infection, you need to have an idea what kind of virus you are um, suspecting your plants is infected with. Why is this a case? Because in order to do PCR, you need to design a primer. And in order to design a primer, so a primer is a short-stranded complementary nucleic acid that would then target and anneal to your target sequence of the virus. In order to do this, you need to actually know what you're looking for. So you cannot detect a total unknown with this method. The same goes with ELISA or Western blot, which is um, you need to know what virus it is you're looking for. So then you can choose the correct antibody to then target your virus protein of interest. And now let's talk about transmission for a bit. So majority of plant viruses, as I mentioned earlier, needs to be affected by insects. So, because plants is unable to move, so can plant viruses manipulate the behavior of their factor in order to facilitate the transmission? So virus transmission by insects have three different um, modes of transmission. So the first is non-persistent, which means the virus is only retain at the mouth of the insect. So they have sh for this mode of transmission, um, insects doesn't need a long time to acquire the virus. They could land on the plant, feed, and then acquire the virus within a few minutes. 
but they will also lose the virus pretty quickly, for example, probably only for a couple of hours, after, especially after they left the attracted plant. Um, number th the second one is semi-persistent, so virus particles is swallowed and circulates inside the insect's body. And then when the insect land on a pelty plant and start feeding, they will then regurgitate the virus out again. And then the last one is persistent, so virus particles circulate and replicate inside the insect body. It takes longer for insects to acquire the virus this way, it can be from hours to days, but often insects will then retain the virus in their body for weeks or months or even throughout their lifetime until the insect died. So non-persistent transmission by aphid is the most common means of a plant virus being factored. So they stay on the mouth part, aphid acquire the virus really quickly, even when they only probes on the epidermal cell. And then, yeah, the virus particles are lost within a few hours. But it's important to remember that if it can transmit many, many different plant viruses, and certain viruses would also be transmitted in a persistent way, which means they will then be swallowed and ingested by the aphids. So this is an example of how a plant virus can alter the plant host in order to make them more attractive to aphid. So this is a work done by um, Mark et al, actually back a while ago now, back in 2010, where they studied that cucumber plants infected by cucumber mosaic virus emit volatiles that are more attractive to aphids. So more aphid would come and feed on the infected plants. However, these plants also produce compounds that are distasteful to the aphid. So after aphid landed and feed on the plants, they would then actually leave the plants more frequently, which is good for the virus because aphid departing from the plants would then be carrying virus particles on their mouth parts, which would then facilitate onward transmission of the virus. So this kind of knowledge is useful to think of how, for example, one would manage or if you want to control the virus spread in the field, knowing um, how the insect factor move and behave when virus is around can be really, really useful to target um, pest management practices. So in the lab, we use, usually use model plants. Model plants are plants that are easily grown in the lab, well studied um, and are, fair, are easy to um, modify genetically. So tobacco and Arabidopsis are the two most common model plants used. Um, Mysis persicio, the green peach aphid, again, one of the most well-studied aphid, and cucumber mosaic virus. So I'm just going to show you a quick example of how the same virus and the same factor can cause two quite different um, effects based on the host plant. So on the left-hand side, when we have Arabidopsis as the host plant, cucumber mosaic virus infection would actually reduce aphid fitness on this plant. So aphid reproduce less and they're more, they're deterred from feeding for a long time. However, in contrast on tobacco, CMV infection actually make the plant a better host for the aphid if it grew better and reproduce more. So, what would be the benefit to the virus then um, for this? So the hypothesis was perhaps um, both are beneficial to the virus. For example, in Arabidopsis, when the virus made the plant a less favorable host to the aphid, what happened was this will then um, promote rapid movements of aphid from one plant to another because they didn't want to stay for long which is good for the virus because it means that they'll be transmitted faster. However, um, in contrast on tobacco, where CMV infection actually make the plant a better host uh, and then causes aphid to reproduce better, it means they then will build up populations on that plant, which would be good, for example, when um, the environmental condition was not so favorable. So aphid have then a chance to be um, to build up the population, and eventually then spread as well. So both scenarios are still beneficial to the virus. So um, the last couple of slides 
it's going to be a preview about how do we translate lessons from model plants to crops because it is nice to study things in the lab but how then how then the study be useful um, to crops in the field so the knowledge of that how a virus can cause two different effects for example they can make a plant more attractive or less attractive to the factor in the field for example um, can one use a mixture of aphid attractive and aphid repellent plants for example to reduce virus transmission in the field so if this is just a hypothetical scenario if you have the crop plants you wanted to protect can one perhaps plant um, rows of plant around the crop that is very attractive to aphids but perhaps is resistant to the virus so then this decoy plant would attract aphid to feed onto them and then drew them away from the crop plants that you want to be protected so this is um yeah this is another option at how knowledge we learn in the lab can then be useful um, for the field and as far as infection always detrimental to the plant so virus infection is a form of symbiosis virus are parasites but infection is not always completely detrimental to the host um, for example uncertain plant actually virus infection um, make the plant more resistant to drought for example abidopsis in tomato virus infected tomatoes are more attractive to pollinators such as bumblebee and on wheat plants virus infection actually make the plant um, better at withstanding harsh and abiotic stresses as well and therefore it's a fine balance as a farmer if virus infection doesn't affect your crops in a very detrimental way perhaps it is better to just um, leave it be because otherwise it means then you have to spend a lot of money in order to control the virus spread in the field but again um, this is different for every crop different for every location um, climate etc so this is an example when virus infection actually benefited the plant in a way so on tomato plants virus infected tomato are visited more often by bumblebees which offer pollination services but one thing to remember is that bumblebees does not track the CMV so a hypothesis for this is thought to be perhaps this is some kind of payback mechanism so viruses make tomato more attractive to pollinators as a payback mechanism from virus to their host so as a closing statement um, I'd just like to emphasize that yeah not all virus infection can be detrimental some of them are beneficial or some also have no um, neutral effect to the host plant so I'd like to wrap up now uh, and so in summary we know that viruses are obligate parasite that will reprogram their host cells in order to enter the plant cell virus need to be factored by insects or um, coming via mechanical wounding molecular biology can be useful to aid virus identification but one needs to have certain knowledge of what kind of virus you're dealing with whether it's dna or rna in order to aid you in your identification methods um, plant viruses can alter the behavior of their insect factors to facilitate virus transmission and this is very useful to know for example if one wants to manage virus spread in the field uh, viruses are symbionts and they can they are usually detrimental but some can be actually beneficial to their host so as a closing statement um, i'd just like to draw your attention to a very useful online resource um, if you haven't already known uh, it's called the kabi plantwise the link is there so this has a huge amount of freely available online data to diagnose disease plants in the field it has symptoms um, pictures videos uh, they have map of different pest locations in different countries and it's all free to use so please check them out so that's the website uh, yeah so thank you everyone um, i hope you enjoy this talk and again email me for questions or see you in the live q a sessions Bye for now.